Chapter 7 Ted When I told Miranda that I was planning on coming up to Kennewick for a week at the beginning of October, there was a look of genuine pleasure on her face. We were sitting across from one another in the first-floor kitchen of our brownstone, eating linguine with clam sauce, the one dish I can make, and finishing a bottle of Pinot Gris. That'll be amazing, she said. I'll get you all to myself for an entire week. I watched her face for any signs of deceit, but saw none. Her dark brown eyes had brightened with what looked to me like real excitement. And for a moment, I believed her, and felt the warmth and reassurance one feels when someone else wants to spend time with you. A second later, that feeling passed, and I was again amazed at my wife's acting skills, her duplicitous nature. Did she feel no guilt for what she was doing with Brad Dackett? Should we get that sweet again? she asked. Which one? Boo, how soon you forget. The first place we stayed. With the whirlpool tub? Right, sure. After cleaning up, we went upstairs to watch television, settling on a remake of Sleuth that was being shown on one of the 500 movie channels we had. Miranda had changed into the short nightshirt she'd taken to wearing in the evenings and was stretched out along our couch, her feet in my lap. I studied her toes, meticulously painted a deep shade of pink. I took one of her feet in my hands and pressed a thumb along its baby soft sole. She said nothing, but her body reacted by sliding almost imperceptibly closer to me, her feet arching. Her languid presence made me acutely aware of myself, my knotted shoulders, the uncomfortable shirt I was still wearing, the way I sat rigidly by the armrest, my elbow cocked unnaturally. I took my hand off my wife's foot, but she didn't seem to notice. I knew that she would be asleep soon, before the movie had finished. Going to Maine for the week had been Lily's idea, suggested toward the end of our meeting at the Concord River Inn. She said it was important for me to know what went on up there, what Brad's work schedule was like, how Miranda spent her days. With me up there, everything will be different, I had said. Miranda and Brad will act differently. It doesn't matter. I'm more interested in the work habits of the crew on your house. How many people are there on a regular basis? How often is Brad there alone? Just observe. The more information you get, the better off we'll be. I'd agreed. The hardest part was clearing my schedule for a week. But I'd insisted, and Janine, my assistant, had managed to reschedule everything. The plan was that I'd go up to Kennewick late on a Friday and return to Boston nine days later on a Sunday afternoon. In a strange way, I had begun to look forward to the extended time away, and I was secretly reveling in the idea that I would be putting Brad and Miranda's affair on hold. I wondered what Brad's reaction would be when Miranda told him. Even sitting there on my couch, having broken the news to Miranda, I felt the power shifting in my favor. Miranda twitched, and I turned to look at her in the flicker of the television's 84-inch screen. Her eyes were closed, and her lips slightly parted. She had fallen asleep. I stared at her for a while instead of at the movie. Deep shadows accentuated her curves, and her face, cast in the TV's light, seemed a black-and-white version of herself. Her mouth opened a little farther. A nerve fluttered in her temple. I was fascinated by her raw beauty, while at the same time realizing that she would not age well. Her face, rounded and doll-like, would turn puffy, and her pin-up body would sag. But she wouldn't grow old, would she? I was going to kill her, wasn't I? That was the plan. And the thought of doing it, and getting away with it, filled me with a sense of gratification and power. But also fear and sadness. I hated my wife. But I hated her because I'd loved her once. Was I making a mistake that I would regret for the rest of my life? When I thought this way, when I began to be frightened by what I was planning to do, I wanted to make contact with Lily, to hear her talk about murder in her casual way, as though she were talking about throwing away an old couch. But we had agreed to not talk for a while, to not meet, until I had spent my week in Maine. And that was another reason I was looking forward to that week in Kennewick. Each day was getting me one day closer to being back with Lily. John, the hotel concierge, who often manned the check-in desk, told me that Miranda was in the livery, then offered to have my bags taken to the suite. I thanked him and went to find Miranda, 
navigating the narrow colonial-era stairs that pitched steeply toward the inn's lower levels. The tavern, named for the livery stable it had once been, had stone floors, a stone fireplace, and a long oak bar that curved like the lines of a yacht. Miranda was alone at the bar, but talking animatedly to the tattooed bartender, whose name was either Sid or Cindy, I could never remember. I interrupted them, kissed my wife, noting the absence of the taste of cigarettes on her mouth, then ordered a Hendrix martini. I shed my wool blazer, soaked from the walk from the car to the inn. It had been drizzling in Boston, but in Maine the rain had become biblical, my wipers on full speed barely able to clear the windshield. You're soaked, Miranda said. It's pouring. I had no idea. I haven't been outside all day. Sid, Cindy, was delivering my drink. She lives the life, your wife, she said, and laughed hoarsely as she said it. I know she does, I turned to Miranda. What did you do all day? It wasn't an entire waste. I made decisions on furniture for all the guest rooms, and I got a massage, and I waited with bated breath for my husband. Oh, I almost forgot. She held up her nearly empty beer. To one whole week. I clinked it with my glass of cold gin and took a long sip, the drink instantly making me feel warmer. Have you eaten? Miranda asked. I told her that I hadn't and flipped open a menu to take a look. We stayed till closing time, and I got drunk enough so that when Miranda and I stumbled to the suite at the back of the inn, then fell naked across the king-size bed, I barely thought of the reasons I was in Maine for an entire week, or of Brad Daggett, or even of Lily. The following morning, the rain was done. The clouds all swept out to sea, and it was one of those October days that sell calendars. The sky was a hard metallic blue, and the trees had turned into bouquets of red and yellow. After lunch, Miranda and I walked to the house. I timed it. It took twenty-five minutes along the Micmac Road, not much longer than it took along the cliff walk. Route 1A was the busiest road in this part of the world, but this section of Micmac was scenic, with its periodic views from the bluff above the Atlantic, so a lot of cars went by during my walk. Micmac Road branched out from 1A at Kennewick Center, then past Kennewick Harbor and Kennewick Beach, the three major sections that formed the town. Kennewick Beach was the less exclusive section of the Kennewick shoreline, a long, sandy stretch bunched with rental cottages, and across the road a campsite that became filled with Winnebago's in the summertime. I didn't know this for a fact, but I thought I remembered Miranda telling me that Brad owned one of those semicircular clusters of rental cottages, and that, since his divorce, he was living in one of them year-round. I hadn't paid attention when she told me these facts, because... At the time, I didn't know that he was sleeping with my wife. But now I was paying attention. To everything. There was only one vehicle parked in our driveway. A Toyota pickup truck with a bumper sticker that read, If God didn't want us to eat animals, he wouldn't have made them out of meat. That's Jim, Miranda said. Brad's having him do the drywall in the basement. We walked around to the back of the house and entered through the patio doors. It was impossible to not think of the last time I'd been here, of the first spying on Brad and Miranda sharing a cigarette in the kitchen, then later, crouching at the terminus of the cliff walk, watching them fuck in our future living room. Wait till you see the bar downstairs. Miranda led me across the finished hardwood floors of the foyer, her steps echoing sharply in the empty space. Jim was downstairs, listening to classic rock on a dusty radio and eating his lunch perched on a plastic, quickrete barrel that had been turned upside down. He seemed flustered and embarrassed by our presence, as though he'd been caught asleep on the job instead of simply eating a sub. He turned the music down. Brad'll be out a little later. You looking for him? We're just looking. Ted hasn't even seen it down here since... Since... She turned to me, and I shrugged. I didn't think I'd been to this part of the house since just after the house had been framed. I knew that Miranda was insisting on making an extensive man cave for me, even though it was something I'd never asked for. She was picturing leather furniture, a pool table, a full bar and dark red walls. When she had first mentioned this, I had viewed it as a sign of Miranda's generosity, that she had wanted to make a special place in the house just for me. Now thinking about it, it just pissed me off that she was spending my hard-earned money on something I wasn't sure I would ever use. 
She gave me a tour, showed me the finished bar shelving, the space where the pool table would go, and let me see swatches of the possible colors she had in mind for the walls. When we left, Jim had finished his lunch and resumed his work. A steely dance song played from the radio. We didn't see Brad that day, till we were all done with our tour and walking back down the driveway toward the road. He roared up in his truck, scattering gravel as he came to a sudden halt. He killed the engine and swung out of the driver's seat. He wore navy blue chinos and a tucked-in flannel shirt, and moved with an easy athleticism. He shook my hand, as he always did, and made solid eye contact when he asked me what I thought of the progress so far. As we talked, Miranda appeared disinterested, gazing back toward the house and its view of the ocean, placid and still in the quiet afternoon. I hear you're here all week, Brad said. I thought I'd take a little vacation, keep an eye on Miranda. Brad laughed. And maybe I was overanalyzing, but he laughed a little too heartily. I could see the fillings in his teeth. In my peripheral vision, I saw Miranda swing her head back to take a look at him. She's the real general contractor on this job. She missed her calling, this one, Brad said. That's what she keeps telling me. I'm right here, you know, Miranda said. You can include me in the conversation. Before Miranda and I left to walk back to the inn, I told Brad that he should swing by the tavern that night, have a drink with us. He told us he'd try and make it. Aren't you chummy? Miranda said when we were back on Micmac. He's your chum. I was just trying to be friendly so that he doesn't feel like he has to stay away now that I'm in town. What do you mean? I thought you two were friends. He's never met you at the inn for a drink? God, no. He lives in this town. He's not going to pay five bucks for a Bud Light. Where do people who live in this town go to drink? There's some place called Cooley's along Kennewick Beach, where I have not personally been invited yet. We should go some time this week. We can't eat at the inn every night. I'd be up for that, I said. The sidewalk narrowed for a stretch, and Miranda slid her arm through mine, pulled us closer together. Despite the brightness of the sun, it was cold where the sidewalk was shaded. I asked, So you don't think Brad will show up tonight? I have no idea. Maybe he'll feel he has to since you're writing the checks and you asked, but I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't. You and him have really never had a drink together? I just figured you had since... You shared cigarettes and all that. God, that really bothered you, didn't it? No, Brad and I are not friends, but we are friendly. He's an employee, and he's doing a great job, and I respect him. But I don't necessarily need to become his drinking partner. Besides, from what I hear, he has plenty of drinking partners already in this town. What do you mean? What do you hear? I've heard from some of the other guys on the crew that he drinks a lot and screws around a lot. That's why his wife left him. Not that it's any of our business, so long as he gets the job done. Why are you suddenly so interested? I'm up here for a week. I thought I'd get to know some folks, some of the people you've been spending time with. I made one friend here, and it's Sid. She's the one who told me about coolies and about Brad's reputation. Let's go back to our room, take a nap, and get a drink. Sound good? Brad didn't show up that night at the tavern. Miranda and I sat at the curving end of the bar, drinking wine and talking with Sid, even though she was busy with the Saturday night crowd. Sid had spiky blonde hair and intricate tattoos that covered one entire arm. When she spoke to us, she never took her eyes off Miranda, something I was familiar with, and something that at other points in my life I had actually enjoyed. Maybe Miranda and Sid were having sex as well. Maybe Miranda was having sex with every Tom, Dick, and Sally in Kennewick. Throughout the course of the evening, Every time someone swung through the heavy tavern doors, I would glance over to see if it was Brad. Miranda never looked. Either she knew he wasn't coming or she didn't care. And since I doubted that she didn't care, I assumed that somehow she knew something I didn't, that they'd found a way to communicate, or that she already knew he had plans. I didn't see Brad again until Monday afternoon, when a cold mist was coming off the ocean, and I decided to explore the cliff walk. Miranda was napping. That morning we had driven up the coast to look at a lighthouse that was apparently worth looking at. It was at the end of a hook of land where the fog was particularly thick. We took photographs in which the lighthouse was barely visible, then drove farther up the coast and ate lunch at a clam shack that was closing for the season that week. Returning to the inn, Miranda suggested a nap, as she did every afternoon, and I joined her. 
In a strange way, the sex we'd been having since I knew that Miranda was unfaithful was better than it had been before. Anger toward my wife had made me become selfish, less interested in her needs and only interested in mine, and she was responding to me in ways she never had before. That afternoon, I'd flipped Miranda onto her stomach and entered her from behind, holding her in that position even after she told me she wanted me facing her. I spread my body along hers, pushing my face into the tangled hair at her neck, gripping her wrists. I was surprised when she came shortly before I did, emitting a strange yelping sound. Afterward, she murmured, You were quite the animal today. I liked it. She curled into the fetal position, and I watched her fall asleep. I counted the knuckles of her spine, studied the dual dimples above her buttocks, wondered about a quarter-sized bruise high up on her thigh. As she began to lightly snore, my thoughts turned paranoid again. Was she this relaxed after having sex with Brad? Did she consider this her due, a lifetime of men catering to all her needs? All the tension that the sex had temporarily extinguished came flooding back. I wondered what it would feel like to punch her as hard as I could in the back of the neck. I dressed and slipped out of the room, not leaving a note. I felt better once I was on the cliff walk, enveloped in the cold mist, staring out toward the opaque ocean. I walked fast, concentrating on the slippery footing, trying not to think of the last time I had taken this route to the house. When I reached the end of the walk, I checked my watch noting that it had taken a little over thirty minutes to reach my new home from the Kennewick Inn. I stood on the bluff, staring toward the rear of my house. I wasn't afraid of being spotted this time. I was a lord surveying my manor. I walked across the damp stretch of land and looped around toward the front of the house through a stand of balsam firs. As I approached the driveway, I watched a truck pull away and assumed I had just missed Brad. But as I came fully around the house, I saw his two-tone pickup truck with him next to it, a cigarette jutting from his lips. He was punching a number into his cell phone, but stopped when he spotted me. He smiled, and the cigarette bobbed up and down. I smiled back and walked toward him, hand outstretched. It was time I got to know Brad Daggett. Chapter 8 Lily I hadn't planned on falling in love, but who does? Eric Washburn was a junior and president of a literary fraternity at Mather called St. Dunstan's, although I didn't know that at the time I met him. We met in the library. It was closing time on a frigid February night, and we were the last to leave, passing through the swinging glass doors together into an eye-watering wind. Eric offered me a cigarette, which I didn't accept, then lit his own, and asked me what direction I was going in. He walked me to Barnard Hall, a gesture that at the time seemed born entirely from gallantry, and not from more sinister motives. At my entryway, he invited me to a Thursday night party at St. Dunstan's. I told him I would come. He wasn't particularly handsome. He had a long face and a high forehead, a bony nose and two big ears but was tall and slender, and his voice was deep and almost melodic. That night, he was wearing a long charcoal gray coat and a burgundy scarf that he had wrapped several times around his neck. I had heard of St. Dunstan's, knew that it was the most elite society at a college that already had its share of prep school snobbery, and I was very familiar with its location, the manor a stone and slate piece of Gothic revival architecture that broached the northern edge of campus, where Mather spilled out into the urban wasteland of Newchester's streets. It was a beautiful building, its stonework gilded with carvings and gargoyles, its front door tall and arched, and its windows all of stained glass. It was the type of architecture that had attracted me to the college in the first place. I'd looked at several places, but Mather, a 200-year-old private college with just under a thousand students, had been the only place that felt right. With its gabled brick dorms, its archways, its elm-lined quad, 
It was like a campus stuck in some earlier time. The campus of a mystery novel set in the 1930s, where boys sang in barbershop quartets and girls in skirts walked briskly from class to class. To the deep dismay of my mother, who had been lobbying for Oberlin, her own alma mater, since I was five, and the unsurprising indifference of my father, I'd chosen Mather. Lily, Eric said after inviting me to Dunstan's. What's your family name? Kintner. Oh, right, you're Kintner. I heard you were here. The way he'd said it sounded a little rehearsed, as though he'd already known who I was. You know my father? Of course I do. He wrote left over right. I was surprised. Most of my father's fans mentioned slightest folly, his boarding school farce, and I had never heard anyone mention his comedy about the life of a London tailor. What time? I asked. I was propping open Barnard's exterior door and was anxious to get inside. Tenish. Wait, hold on. Eric dug into the pocket of his large coat and pulled out a small square card that he handed to me. It was white, printed with a letterpress image of a skull. Show this at the front door. I said good night and entered my dorm. Jessica, my roommate, was still up and I told her about the invite. She was deeply invested in the social life of Mather, and I was curious what she would know about Eric Washburn and the Thursday night party. You got a skull card? She said and snatched it from my fingers. Then said even louder, You got a skull card from fucking Eric Washburn? What do you know about him? He's like royalty. I think his great-great-great-great-grandfather basically built Mather. You honestly hadn't heard of him? I've heard of St. Dunstan's. Well, of course you've heard of St. Dunn's. Is the invite a plus one? I don't think so. He didn't say it was. I went to the party, and I went alone. Eric was there, behind the bar when I first arrived, and he made me a vodka tonic without asking me what I wanted first. Then he took me by the arm and introduced me to several St. Dunstan's members before returning to his bartending duties. He said it was a rotating Thursday night job, and he'd drawn the short straw. I was slightly disappointed with the interior of the manor, expecting something that more closely matched its gothic exterior. I don't know what exactly— Persian rugs and leather chairs. Instead, it was a slightly nicer version of the other fraternities I'd been to my freshman year. Low-ceilinged rooms, tatty furniture, and the ubiquitous smell of marble lights and cheap beer. I wandered its first-floor rooms, talking to several members, many of whom asked me about my father. After drinking my third vodka, I went to the bar to say goodbye to Eric and thank him for inviting me. Come next week, he said, and dug out another skull invite for me from his pocket. I won't be bartending. When I got home, Jessica pressed me for every detail. I told the truth, that there was nothing particularly interesting about St. Dunstan's, and that everyone there seemed nice while not being wildly fascinating. I told her there were no secret passageways or initiation rituals. I told her that there wasn't a room lined with the skulls of freshman girls. Gross, Lily. You didn't meet Matthew Ford, did you? I met a Matthew. He was short with long bangs. God, he's hot. For better or for worse, St. Dunstan's became my primary social life that winter and spring. I went to all their Thursday night parties and an occasional dinner party as one of the members' date. I wasn't sure why I was invited as often as I was. Eric seemed to have a girlfriend, a fellow junior named Faith, who tended to hang around him toward the end of most parties. One night, I walked into the billiard room at the manor and saw them kissing. They were pressed up against a built-in bookshelf. Faith was on the tips of her toes, and even so, Eric had to stoop to kiss her. One of his hands was tangled in her hair, and the other was pressed against the small of her back. Eric was facing me, and we made brief eye contact 
as I backed out of the room. Other members of the society, St. Dunstan's was technically not a fraternity, and they didn't refer to themselves as brothers, would occasionally make a pass at me, but never in the groping, sweaty way that I had experienced at fraternity houses the few times I had gone with Jessica my fall semester. No, the passes at Thursday night parties were usually slurred compliments about my looks, followed by clumsy offers of another drink or some other recreational drug in their dorm room. I always refused, not because the boys who made the offers were particularly repellent, but because, despite the presence of beautiful, dark-haired Faith, I was in love with Eric Washburn and had been since the first party at the manor when he had slipped from behind the bar to guide me around the rooms, introducing me to his friends. It was the way he had held my arm, just above the elbow, as though he were telling me and others that I belonged to him, if only slightly. Eric was the reason I kept going to St. Dunstan's, although I enjoyed talking to other members even when they were making drunken passes. The boys I met there could easily have been classified as preppy snobs, boys who had been born on third base and thought they hit a triple, as my mother often quoted. But they were also usually polite and made conversation in which the main point was not how wasted they had been the night before or how wasted they planned on getting tonight. They were boys pretending to be men, so they tried a little harder to impress me with thoughts on politics and ideas about literature. And even if it was all a ruse, I appreciated the effort. Because I had first been invited to St. Dunstan's by Eric, I would usually seek him out to say goodbye when I left one of the Thursday night parties. He would press one of the skull cards into my hand and ask me to come the following week. If he wasn't around at the end of a party, he would manage to find me at some point during the week to give me an invite, and once he left a card in my mailbox at the student center. I considered the invites evidence of a small romance, a very small one, but it was also my first, and it was enough for me. My last exam of freshman year was on a Tuesday afternoon, and I had arranged to take the bus the following morning from New Chester to Shepog, where my mother would pick me up and drive me to Monk's. After my exam, I had planned on packing up my few belongings while enjoying the solitude of a final night in Barnard Hall. Jessica had finished her exams early and left the day before. Coming back from my American Lit survey exam, I found a skull card on the linoleum floor of my dorm room. A message from Eric scrawled on the back. Two full kegs. Come help us finish them tonight. After finishing my packing, I walked across the muddy campus toward the manor and wasn't surprised to find only a few members and a few girlfriends circled around the bar. Most students had already left. Eric seemed wildly pleased to see me, and I drank more than I usually did, happy to note that Faith was nowhere around. I even asked Eric about her. Oh, she's gone, Kintner. Literally and figuratively. What do you mean? I had a sudden, horrific feeling that she died and I hadn't heard about it. She's gone from here. He gestured around him with an open palm. And she's gone from here. He pointed at his heart and several of his friends guffawed. I realized that Eric was drunker than I'd seen him before. I'm sorry, I said. Don't be sorry. She was not for me. Good riddance and good luck. He made another theatrical gesture. I suddenly knew that Eric had invited me to St. Dunn's that night in order to seduce me, and that I was going to let him do it. It was what I had been waiting for. I had no illusions that it would be anything other than a one-night stand. But I was a virgin, and I had decided that the time was right. I was not so foolish as to believe that 
I had to lose my virginity to someone who was in love with me, but it was important that I lose my virginity to someone that I loved. St. Dunstan's Manor had three single bedrooms on its second floor. Since Eric was president, he had the largest room, a high-ceilinged single with a view toward the college chapel. Instead of a single utilitarian cot, he had a four-poster bed made of darkly stained wood. Eric seemed more nervous than I was at first as we lay, fully clothed, kissing on his bed. He excused himself to go to the bathroom, so I took off my clothes and got under the covers. When he returned, he had splashed cold water on his face, and his mouth tasted of toothpaste. He stripped to his boxers and slid under the covers with me. Should I wear a condom? He asked. I told him yes. I didn't tell him I was a virgin because I didn't want him to have second thoughts. We had sex twice that night, the first time with him on top of me. Because of his height, I found myself fixated on the few sparse hairs that covered the center of his thin chest in a triangle formation. He moved awkwardly, and I wasn't sure he was enjoying himself, but when I lifted my knees high up by his sides, he said my name in a high, breathy voice. And it was over. Later that night, we had sex again with me on top. It was helpful to see his face below me, lit dimly by a street lamp through his window. I had come to love his face, even for all its awkwardness. The saucer ears, the expanse of forehead, the thin lips. Eric had stunning eyes, dark brown and with beautiful thick eyelashes like a girl's. While on top of him, I changed the rhythm, slowing down, then speeding up again. After doing this several times, Eric suddenly pulled me down toward him, took one of my nipples into his mouth, and shuddered. Later, he asked me if I'd had an orgasm. I told him that I hadn't, but that it had felt good, which was the truth. I left before dawn, he was stirring as I dressed, but I managed to get out of the room before he woke. I didn't want to listen to false promises. Over the summer, I wanted my memories of Eric to only be good ones. That summer was the first one after my parents' divorce was final. My mother was manic, obsessing over rumors that David was already engaged again and frantically putting together a show for a New York gallery. I spoke with my father on the phone twice. He invited me to visit him in London, but I declined, happy to spend a summer in Connecticut reading. Monks was blessedly empty of house guests. My benign aunt was around for all of August, but my mother had elected for a moocher-free summer, as she put it. I didn't hear from Eric, but even if he had wanted to, he had no way to contact me. As far as I knew, he didn't know where I lived, or my mother's unlisted phone number. For my housing request my sophomore year at Mather, I had applied for a single, despite Jessica's protests that we made perfect roomies. In August, I got a letter from the housing department that I had been given a quad with three roommates, a trio of girls I didn't know. Either I was stuck with three other students who were antisocial enough that they all requested a single for their second year of college, or they were three friends who had put in for a triple. The good news was that the room was in Robinson Hall, the oldest dorm on campus, a brick tower that fronted the quad. All of the four-bedroom dorm rooms had built-in window seats, and a few had working fireplaces. I arrived late in the evening on move-in day. My three new roommates were clearly a trio of close-knit friends and had decorated the common room in posters from David Lynch films and The Smiths. I recognized them from freshman year but didn't know them personally. They all had pitch-black hair and pale complexions. Goth versions of prep school girls. To me, they looked like Winona Ryder from three different films. 
The most radical had spiked hair and wore only black, like Winona from Beetlejuice. The other two were preppier, Winona from Reality Bites, bobbed hair swept off the forehead, and Winona from Mermaids, cardigans, pearls and bangs, maybe ironic, maybe not. I don't know how the three Winonas viewed me that September night as I arrived in capri pants and a collared linen shirt, but despite their dark lipstick and double-pierced ears, they were friendly, offering to turn down Joy Division as I unpacked. I had just accepted a glass of wine from Mermaid's Winona when there was a rap at the door. It was Eric Washburn. I was so surprised that for a brief moment I thought, he must be there for one of my new roommates. But he was there for me. He was wearing cargo shorts and an Oxford shirt and smelled of cigarettes and whiskey. I went with him back to the manor and straight up to his room. He told me how he thought of me all summer, how he tried desperately to find out where I lived. He even told me that he was sure he loved me. And, like a fool... I believed him. Chapter 9 Ted Brad and I had started off by drinking beers. Then had switched at some point to Jameson and Ginger's. We were sitting at a high-backed booth at Cooley's, one of the few year-round bars in the Kennewick Beach area. The menus boasted that they'd been open since 1957. No one would doubt the truth of this claim. The back of the bar was cluttered with grimy knick-knacks, delivered by a thousand liquor reps throughout the years. Schlitz wall sconces, a Jenny light mirror, a Spuds McKenzie light-up dog. I was happy with the switch to Jameson and Ginger. It made it easier for me to get myself a pure ginger ale when it was my turn to get the drinks. After finding Brad at the house site getting ready to leave, I had been the one to suggest we get a beer. He happily accepted, offered me a ride, and took me the couple miles to Cooley's at Kennewick Beach. It was just after five when we arrived, and we were the first customers. The bartender, a college-age girl in tight black jeans and purple tank top, said, Hi, Braggett, when we walked in. What did she call you? I asked after we'd slid into a middle booth. Braggett. It's my nickname around here, Brad plus Daggett. High school thing. First round's on me, boss. He slid back out of the booth and toward the bar. I didn't know exactly what it was I was hoping to get from Brad by drinking with him, but Lily had asked me to gather information, so that was what I was doing. The more I knew about him, the better off I would be. For the first hour of the evening, Brad and I talked about the progress on the house. He struck me as he'd always struck me, 80% consummate professional and 20% bullshitter, like the car salesman who honestly steers you away from the leather upholstery but still manages to sell you the expensive navigation system. We drank Heineken's, and, as we talked, I watched him closely. He was a serious drinker, consistently polishing off a bottle of beer in three long sips. And while he was still handsome, some wear and tear was starting to show. There were dark patches of sun damage on his tanned face, and the beginnings of a rosy drinker's hue on both cheeks. Despite his muscular frame, there was a softness beginning under his chin, that was only partly disguised by his salt-and-pepper goatee. His best feature was his dark brown eyes and a full head of black hair that was going gray at the temples. After talking about the house through several beers, I said, I hope Miranda hasn't been driving you too crazy. She's very particular about what she wants. That's a good thing. The worst clients are the ones who keep changing their minds. No, Mrs. Severson's been great. Brad slid a marble red out of the pack, that had been sitting on the table since we'd sat down. He tapped the filter a few times against the varnished wood, then asked if I'd mind if he stepped outside to smoke. While he was gone, I took a look at my phone, which had been vibrating silently off and on in my pocket for the past twenty minutes. Miranda had sent me a succession of texts, culminating in, Seriously, where the F are you? I texted her back that I was having a few drinks with Brad and would be back to the hotel shortly. I told her to feel free to get dinner without me. She texted back, okay, then a few seconds later, XO, XO, XO. I spun around in my booth and looked out through Cooley's front windows toward where Brad was standing. 
blowing smoke into the now dark evening. From the angle of his head, it looked as though he were staring at his phone as well, possibly typing into it. Maybe he was texting my wife as well. A moment of rage flared up in me, but I reminded myself that I was on a fact-finding mission. The war had begun with this slightest of skirmishes, and the more Brad drank, the more chance I had of discovering his weak points. I went to the bathroom, bringing my three-quarters full beer, and dumped most of it down the sink in an attempt to keep relatively sober. When Brad returned, the subject of Miranda did not come up again. He started to ask me questions about my work and my life in general, and when he learned that I'd gone to Harvard, he began questioning me on what I knew about their hockey program and how many beanpot tournaments I'd been to. Despite not caring, I had actually been to a couple of hockey games with my sophomore year roommate, a sports-obsessed English major who went on to become a successful magazine editor. From hockey, we moved on to the previous year's Red Sox season, a subject I knew a little more about. I told him how I shared a block of season tickets in one of the luxury boxes, and I promised to take him to a game the following year. After switching to Jameson's and feeling that I had exhausted my limited repertoire of sports conversation, I asked him about his divorce. I have two great kids, he said, after removing another cigarette from his hard pack and tapping it down on the table, and a fucking ball buster of an ex-wife. Does she have the kids? Except for every other weekend, look, I'll say this for her, and it's all I'll say. But she's a good mom, and the kids are better off with her. But if the marriage hadn't ended when it did, I was going to kill her. Or she was going to kill me, and that's all there is to it. It was fucking non-stop. Brad, where the fuck are you? Come home early and fix the toilet. Brad, Brad, when are you going to take me and the kids to Florida again? Brad, doesn't it bother you to work in all these beautiful homes while your wife and kids live in a shithouse? Non-stop. It's a good thing I didn't own a goddamn gun. He grinned. His teeth were slightly yellowed from the nicotine. You know what I'm talking about, brother, he continued. Or well, maybe you don't. What's the dirt on Miranda? No dirt. We're like newlyweds. All's well in paradise. Oh, fuck, he said in a loud voice. I'll bet it is, he said. He had begun to slur. I'll bet it ish. Then he presented me his fist from across the table, and I bumped it, awkwardly grinning back at him. How had he suddenly become so drunk? Even though we'd been drinking steadily for about two hours, Brad had seemed sober five minutes earlier. No, Miranda's great, I said. No shit, Brad said. I mean, don't get me wrong, you're not a bad-looking guy or anything, but how did you score a wife like that? Just lucky, I guess. Yeah, luck in a few million dollars. As soon as he had said it, his face fell with regret. I didn't have a chance to respond because he instantly put a hand, palm up toward me, and said, Ah, oh, man, that was uncalled for. I didn't mean that the way it came out. It's okay, I said. No, it's not okay. Totally uncalled for. I'm an asshole, and I've had too much to drink. Sorry, man. She's lucky to have you. I'm sure it has nothing to do with the money. I smiled. No, I'm sure it has something to do with the money. I can live with that. No, man, I don't know Miranda well at all, but she doesn't care about that stuff. I can tell. Brad seemed to be ramping up for a long, apologetic monologue, so I was pleased when a heavily made-up blonde slid into the booth next to him and bumped him on the hip. Hey, Braggett, she said, then extended a hand toward me. I gripped her limp fingers in what was technically a handshake as she said, Hi, Braggett's friend, I'm Polly. I'm sure you've heard nothing at all about me. Paul, Brad said. Meet Ted Severson. He's the one building the new house out in Micmac. No shit, Polly smiled at me. Even with a clown-like makeup, you could tell that she was pretty, and had probably once been beautiful. Natural blonde hair, blue eyes, and large breasts that she was showing off in a V-neck shirt and cardigan sweater. The portion of her chest that was visible was deeply tanned and freckled. Brad told me all about that house. It's going to be beautiful, I hear. That's the plan, I said. Well, boys, I was going to intrude on your manly little bonding session, but now that I see you're talking business, I have lost interest. Have a drink, I said. Thanks, anyway. I'll let you two talk. She slid out of the booth, leaving behind a hefty waft of perfume. Girlfriend? I asked Brad. In eighth grade, maybe, Brad said and laughed, showing a lot of his teeth. 
But now that she's here, I wouldn't mind taking off. I live right around the corner. You got another drink in you? Then I'll take you home? Sure, I said. Although the last thing I wanted was another drink. And the next to last thing I wanted was to get in a vehicle with a drunken Brad behind the wheel. But this was a chance to see where Brad lived, and I couldn't pass that up. The night had turned cold, but the mist had lifted, and a multitude of stars wheeled in the sky. Even though Brad's rental cottages were about 300 yards away, he drove me in his truck, parking erratically in front of the first of about a dozen boxy cottages that formed a semicircle across the road from the beach. A hand-painted sign said, Crescent Cottages, then a phone number. Miranda told me you own these, I said as he unlocked the dark cottage. All of them were dark, illuminated only by a street lamp and by the bright night sky. My parents own them, but I run them. We're out of season now, but they do good in the summertime. He flipped on a tall floor lamp as we walked through the front door. It was nicer inside than I expected, but also bleaker. Just a few pieces of utilitarian furniture, the walls painted white and mostly empty. The one item that marked it as Brad's home and not a rental was an enormous TV on a stand that looked out of place in the relatively small living room. I thought it would smell of cigarettes inside, but it didn't. Brad went straight to the fridge in the alcove kitchen, and I shut the flimsy door behind me. I heard two caps popping off bottles, and he returned and handed me a cold Heineken. We sat on the beige couch. Brad slumped a little, his legs spread wide. The beer bottle looked small in his big tanned hands. How long have you lived here? I said, just to say something. About a year. It's a temporary situation. Yeah, I said. I can see that. I mean, you wouldn't want to live here too long. As soon as I said it, I felt a little bad, and I watched a hateful flicker darken Brad's face that he quickly replaced with a thoughtful frown. Like I said, only temporary till the old ship comes in. I said nothing back, and we lapsed into a silence. I looked around, noticing that the stack of fishing magazines on the coffee table were squarely lined up with the corner of the table. On top of the magazines was the remote control, also squarely lined up. On the side table closest to me was a framed picture of a boy and a girl taken on a boat. Both kids, who looked to be about twelve and ten, wore orange life vests. I picked up the picture. These are kids? Jason and Bella. Has taken on my old boat, though. I sold it at the beginning of the summer and bought myself the Albemarle. You fish? I told him no, but he continued to talk about his boat. I was barely listening, but it didn't really matter. I was learning some things about Brad Daggett. Putting aside for now the matter that he was sleeping with my wife, I was discovering that I didn't like Brad Daggett at all. He was a selfish drunk who was probably only going to get more selfish and alcoholic as he got older. He didn't care about his kids beyond placing a photograph of them in his home, and it wasn't clear if he really cared for anyone besides himself. He was a negative in this world. I thought of Lily, and I thought about Brad coming to a sudden end, and I didn't really mind. In fact, I wanted it to happen. Not just because it would punish Brad for what he was doing with my wife, but also because Brad disappearing off this earth would be a good thing. Whose life was he making better? Not his kids or his ex-wife. Not Polly at the bar, who maybe thought she was his girlfriend. He was an asshole, and one less asshole around was good for everybody. I interrupted Brad in his monologue about his boat and told him I was going to the bathroom. It was as clean as the rest of the apartment. I dumped my beer down the sink and took a look in Brad Daggett's medicine cabinet. There wasn't much to look at. Razors and deodorant and hair product a large bottle of generic ibuprofen, a box of hair dye that hadn't been opened, a prescription bottle for antibiotics that had expired over five years earlier. I opened it up and looked inside. The bottle was filled with blue diamond-shaped pills that I recognized as Viagra. So Brad the stud wasn't such a stud, after all. I actually laughed out loud. When I returned to the living room, Brad hadn't shifted position from the couch but his eyes were closed and his chest was lifting and falling steadily. I watched him for a while, trying to feel something besides disgust, trying to feel some pity, maybe, just as a way to test myself. I felt none. Before leaving, I quietly searched a few of the drawers in the kitchen alcove. One of them was a utility drawer filled with tools, measuring tape, a spool of twine, a roll of duct tape. 
Toward the back of the drawer was a Smith & Wesson double-action revolver. I was surprised, only because he had made that earlier joke that he would have killed his wife if he'd owned a gun. For one rash moment, I considered stealing it, then realized he would most likely know who took it. I left it where it was, but I did take a newly minted key from a small box filled with similar keys. He would never miss it, and it was possible that it opened the door to this cottage, or maybe all of the Crescent cottages. I took one last look around before leaving. Brad hadn't moved from his position. I stepped out into the cold, brackish air, then quietly tried the key on Brad's front door. It slid in and turned. I left the door unlocked and pocketed the key. I pulled out my phone and was about to call Miranda to have her come and pick me up when I decided I might walk. The cold felt good against my skin. I breathed deeply through my nostrils, the salt in the air making me feel more alive than I'd felt in a while. I began to walk. It was only a few miles, and I felt like I had all the energy in the world. Chapter 10 Lily For all of my sophomore year and Eric's senior year, I spent almost every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night at St. Dunstan's Manor in Eric's second-floor bedroom. At the time, I thought of this period as the happiest of my life. In retrospect, and not just because of what happened later, I realized that it was also a time of uncertainty and anxiety. I was in love with Eric Washburn, and he said he was in love with me. I believed him, but I also knew that we were young, and that Eric was graduating soon with plans to move to New York City and get a job in the financial sector. And my plan was to spend the following school year in London at the Fonts Institute of Art, studying conservation. Even though Eric and I would talk about our future, I told myself I knew that everything was going to change when he graduated. I led two separate but compatible lives that year. From Sunday to Thursday, I did all my reading and schoolwork. My roommates, the three Winonas, played loud music and smoked nonstop cigarettes, but were surprisingly quiet and relatively good-natured. I found I had a lot in common with Mermaid's Winona, a bookworm who, like me, grew up idolizing Nancy Drew. On Thursday evening, I would go to St. Dunstan's Manor for the weekly party. I would bring my largest purse, packed with a change of clothes and a few of my toiletries, since I would always spend the night, and sometimes the weekend. From Friday morning until Sunday evening, Eric and I were rarely apart, with the exception of classes and Eric's racquetball matches, or ultimate frisbee, or any of the numerous pickup games that it was important for him to win. We saw movies at the campus repertory theater and would venture into Newchester to eat Italian food and would sometimes go to parties not hosted by St. Dunstan's or any of its members, but that was rare. We slid into a comfortable relationship filled with predictable routine, a day-to-day -day of inside jokes and what seemed to me to be some highly well-suited sex. We called one another Washburn and Kintner. We were blessedly free of the dramatics of disappointment or infidelity. I cherished what we had become, but kept it to myself, telling Eric and no one else how strong my attachment was. He echoed my feelings and sometimes talked of our future together after Mather. Eric's ex-girlfriend, Faith, was also a senior and still a regular at Thursday night parties. She was now dating Matthew Ford, and because Faith and I were respective girlfriends of the two most prominent members of St. Dunn's, Faith attached herself to me that year, even occasionally asking me questions about my relationship with Eric, although I never took the bait. I didn't particularly like Faith. It was bubbly and devious and liked to be the center of attention. But I didn't mind spending time with her. If Faith hadn't been around at all, curiosity about the girl who had spent two years with Eric might have escalated into obsession. But she was around, and I got to know her, and, because of that, she had no place in my imagination. I could see what had attracted Eric to Faith. 
She was round-faced and sexy, with short black hair. Her clothes were straight out of the official preppy handbook, but her sweaters were always a little too tight, and her skirts were always a little too short. When she talked, she came in close and made disarming eye contact, but she laughed often and made funny jokes about herself. If we went anywhere together, Faith would push her arm through mine, and if she was standing behind me, she would run her fingers through my hair. Neither of my parents had been physically affectionate with me, so I found Faith's touchiness often disturbing and occasionally reassuring. Once, when Faith was drunk, she told me she wanted to study the color of my eyes. She came in close, her own brown eyes huge in my vision. It's like a tapestry in there, Faith said, her breath warm against my cheek. There are flecks of gray and yellow and blue and brown and pink. Eric rarely spoke of Faith, but one night as we lay in his bed, he asked if it bothered me that Faith was around so much. Not really, I said. She's decided we're best friends. Have you noticed that? She's best friends with everyone. No, delete that. I think she genuinely likes you and wants to be your friend. It's just that... Don't worry, I know what you mean. I have no intention of becoming her best friend. I'm not sure we have anything in common besides you. No, you have nothing in common. I can vouch for that. She's not a bad person, and she and Matt make a good pair. I guess so, I said. And that was the extent of our conversation on the subject of faith. That summer, I returned to Monk's. My mother had a new boyfriend, Michael Bialik, a bearded linguistics professor from the university, who was surprisingly grounded. He had his own place about a half mile from ours, a converted barn where he lived with his son, a piano prodigy named Sandy. Michael loved to cook, and because of this, my mother spent a lot of her time at his house, leaving monks to me. My library job was only four hours a day, Monday through Friday, and I spent the rest of my weekday time either reading or puttering around the property. I was in love, and I was at peace. I even returned to my favorite meadow, the final resting place of Chet. The well cover was still in place. It looked the way it had, years ago, when I had first discovered it. Hidden by winter-yellowed grass, the nearby farmhouse was still unoccupied. My plan had been to visit Eric in New York on the weekends, but when Eric came to visit Monks, he fell in love with it. Or at least, he claimed he had. I want to spend every weekend here, Kintner. This will be the perfect life. Weeks in the city, and then I can take the train out Friday evening and be here with you. Country weekends. You won't get bored? Not a chance. I love it here. What about you? I'd be asking you to spend all your time here. You're describing every summer I've ever had. I don't mind. And I'll have you to look forward to on the weekends. And so... Our summer turned out to be a replication of our school year. Weeks alone, weekends together. I didn't mind because I had never minded spending time alone. And the days I spent alone were days that were getting me closer to the weekend. To seeing Eric step off the commuter train, overnight bag slung across his shoulders, huge grin on his face. And these weekends were that much more intense. Away from Mather, our relationship seemed more mature, more comfortable. We felt married. So no, I didn't mind just seeing Eric two days each week. And Eric didn't mind, for reasons of his own. I might never have found out about those reasons, and might have left for London in the fall feeling as though Eric was still the love of my life. If it hadn't been for my father's visiting New York— in the last week of August, and asking to see me for lunch. He had a new book coming out, a collection of short stories, and he was in New York to meet with his American agent and his American publisher, and to give a reading at Strand Books. 
He hadn't invited me to the reading, which wasn't a surprise. I'd asked him once, my junior year of high school, I think, if I could go to one, and he'd replied, God, Lily, you're my daughter. I wouldn't expose you to that. It's bad enough you'll eventually feel the need to read my books, let alone have to listen to me speak them out loud. So I took a day off from the library and caught the train to New York City. My father and I ate lunch in a swank restaurant attached to the lobby of his midtown hotel, and we talked about my upcoming year in London. He promised to email me a list of friends and relatives I had to visit, along with a few of his favorite London landmarks, most of which were pubs. Then he drilled me for tidbits about my mother and the new boyfriend. He was very disappointed to hear that the linguistics professor was, on the whole, a decent man. After lunch, we parted ways in front of the hotel. You turned out all right, Lil, despite your mother and me, he said, not for the first time. We hugged goodbye. It was a strangely nice day for late August in the city, so I headed downtown toward Eric's office, a place I had never visited. The air that had been stifling for the entire month was suddenly free of humidity, and I was just happy to be walking along the quiet midday corridors of the city. I hadn't decided whether I would intrude on Eric's workday to surprise him or not, but was considering it, beginning to imagine the look on his face as I stepped into his office. I was taken out of this reverie by hearing someone shout my name. I turned to see Katie Stone, a junior at Mather, and someone I knew from St. Dunstan's parties, crossing the street and waving at me. I thought that was you, Katie said, stepping onto the curb as a yellow cab hurtled by. I didn't know you were in the city this summer. I'm not. I'm at my mom's house in Connecticut, but my dad's here and I had lunch with him. Do you want to get coffee? I got let out of work early. God, New York's depressing in August. We went to a chain coffee shop at the nearest corner and both ordered iced lattes. Katie prattled on about Mather students we both knew and several I'd never heard of. She was a gatherer and purveyor of gossip, and I was surprised that she wasn't asking me about Eric. So I asked her, Do you see Eric much? Katie's eyes widened a little at the mention of his name. Oh, I wasn't going to bring him up. No, not much, but a little. He works around here somewhere, you know. Yeah, I know. Why weren't you going to bring him up? I just didn't know how you felt, now that you're not seeing each other. I didn't know if you wanted to hear about him. A cold flush went over my skin. I very nearly told Katie that, of course, I was still seeing Eric, but something stopped me. Instead, I asked, Why? What's going on with him? Nothing that I know of. I've seen him a little, but he's never here on the weekends. His dad's sick. Maybe you knew that? No, I said. What's wrong with him? Cancer, I think. Eric goes there every weekend. They must be close. She phrased it like a question, and I managed to nod, despite the sudden need to get out of the coffee shop and away from Katie. Fortunately, Katie's cell phone began to ring, and as she dug within her enormous purse, I excused myself. I borrowed the key from the barista, then locked myself into the closet-size restroom. My mind galloped, desperately trying to understand the information I had just received. And while there was a part of me that was questioning what Katie had said, that it must be some ridiculous misunderstanding, there was a more logical part of me that knew it was true, that I had been a fool. Eric was leading two lives, and no one knew that he was seeing me on the weekends. After returning the key, I saw that Katie was still on her phone, and I took the opportunity to tap her briefly on the shoulder, point at my watch, and move quickly toward the door. Katie lowered the phone and stood, but I simply mouthed the word sorry and kept moving. Once outside, I went down a residential side street. One of the brownstones had stone front steps that were shaded by a leafy tree. 
I crouched high up on the steps, not caring if the owner spotted me and told me to leave. I don't know how long I sat on those steps, but it was probably about two hours. I felt miserable for some of that time, but pretty soon I began to feel calm. I analyzed the situation. Eric had compartmentalized his life with me so that it only happened on the weekends and never in the city. It was the way he operated. It was the way he had operated at college, but why was he lying about where he was on the weekends? There could be only one reason. That Eric was involved with someone here in New York. A little before five o'clock, I walked down toward Eric's office building. I knew the address, but not what it looked like. I walked slowly, my eyes scanning the crowd. I knew that I would not be able to handle running into Eric, but I wasn't ready to leave the city yet. I wanted to see where he worked, maybe even see him without letting him see me. His office was in a nondescript four-story stone building next to a gray's papaya. I sat on a bench across from its entrance and pulled a New York Post from a nearby trash can, unfolding it in front of me but keeping my eyes on the building's front doors. At a little after five, a few men in suits, plus one woman in a skirt and blouse, emerged. No Eric, but he came out in the next group of three men. He wore a light gray suit, and as the three men hit the sidewalk, they all simultaneously lit cigarettes. I wasn't surprised to see Eric smoking, even though he told me he quit on the day of graduation. He'd never once smoked a cigarette while visiting me in Connecticut on the weekend, but that was because he was two people. His co-workers, their cigarettes lit, began walking downtown, but Eric stood for a moment, glancing at his phone. A yellow cab pulled up, and I thought that Eric was going to get into it. But instead, a redhead in a retro mini dress got out and kissed Eric on the mouth as he flicked away his cigarette. They spoke for a moment, Eric's hand on the curve of her hip. My chest hurt, and the world shimmered in front of my eyes. And for a brief moment, I thought I was having a heart attack. Then the worst of it passed. I straightened my back and took a deep breath, studying the girl. She looked familiar, but I had yet to see her face. The fact that she was also a redhead was a twist of the knife, even though I could tell from this distance that this woman's hair came from a hairstylist and not from genetics. Eric and the redhead turned and for one Horrible moment, I thought they were going to step off the curb and cross the street toward me, but they headed north, arms linked. I watched them from over my newspaper and finally caught a good look at the face of Eric's city girlfriend. It was Faith, a red-headed Faith. Looking back, I wasn't really surprised at all that it was Faith. Of course it was but I remember being shocked by the way she had changed her looks, her hair now red like mine. And I was angry. I was the angriest I'd been in years.